Hello, I'm Richard Lund. I'm on a journey. I'm on a journey to live a healthy hundred years. And today I want to share with you one of the ways that I want to get there by eating goji berries. Now these are goji berries. You might have seen them before, might have even eaten some. These are fresh ones. Grew in my garden. I don't know if you've you've actually had fresh ones before. Well, let's just say that they're delicious, but they're not strong in a flavor. They're not very sweet, but they're very pleasant. I think of a peach as something that if it was a peach grown on a farm and I went there, picked them, that would be, and let it ripen fully. That would be a really good flavor, strong flavor. A strawberry, again, grown properly, let it fully mature, would, would have a nice strong flavor. Goji berries, weak flavor, but pleasant. Now, these are commercially available goji berries, little dried ones. These come from a Chinese herb shop that I go to frequently, and um, very delicious. Now, in the middle are the secret ones. <laughs> these are actually wild goji berries. They're, they're not grown on a farm. Now, most goji berries that are commercially available in Chinese herb stores are grown in what's called Ningxia province, which in Ch is in China. In Ningxia province, where these, these are grown, there is a lot of silt from the Yellow River, and uh, as a result, there's a lot of minerals in the soil, and it is a dry climate. It's a good place for growing goji berries, and that is a traditional source of goji berries. They, they use the term geo-authentic. So for herbal use, for the scientific benefits, you really want to get Lichium babarum, which is the scientific name for goji berries, from Ningxia province. There's another uh, common uh, term for goji berry, a wolfberry. I used to know why it was called wolfberry, <laughs> and I've forgotten. I can't remember if it's something to do with the, the character, the Chinese character. Remember in Chinese you have thousands and thousands of characters which describe different words, but only about 400 different sounds. Those are called phonemes. So the phonemes, you only have 400, but you have thousands of characters, so there's going to be some overlap. And sometimes when I am trying to say something in Chinese, the people that I'm are hearing me don't understand at all because there's no context. So we, we need context in, in Mandarin or in Cantonese, I suppose. So then we have these beautiful little wild goji berries. Mm. And they taste kind of like these. It might be a little more, a little more subtle, uh, a little more pungent, a little more of a say a fifth flavor, the uh, umami kind of flavor. I don't know. And uh, I had never actually seen these before until maybe about a week ago. Now, I've been I've been eating goji berries for quite a number of years. So I was kind of surprised when I, I saw them and I just happened to be talking to my friend and he was <laughs> telling me, oh, and these are the wild ones. I thought, you, you never showed them to me before. Oh, we've had them all the time. <laughs> it's like, okay. Anyway, when you go buy goji berries, um, in a good Chinese herb store, uh, the commercial, uh, you know, commercially grown ones that are, you know, conventionally grown, uh, will probably be priced at around $10 a pound, maybe a little more, a little less. And uh, then a premium goji berry, which would be considered, you know, similar to, a, well, let's say a, an organic goji berry, a larger superior grade goji berry would be more around $20 a pound. And then the uh, the wild goji berries here, um, upwards of $50 a pound. So that might be something to think about. If you got a few bucks, you want to try them out? Hey, <laughs> it isn't going to hurt you to spend some money on good food. It's never bad to spend good money on good food. Now, I want to show you some of the way they grow. And earlier today, when I was showing you this, uh, I, I tried another, another uh, take and I messed up and my card ran out, so I didn't get a chance to finish it. But there was actually a bug growing, <laughs> was walking along this twig. 
and uh, you can see how they hang down from the twig and like up here there's a side branch that has come off and they're growing out there so they grow sometimes there's a couple together or three together here and sometimes I've seen them even even more densely packed than this this particular branch came from a goji berry plant that I found locally in my area and I probably paid about twenty or thirty dollars for it and then this other branch here is from a cultivar that I bought from a, a farmer in Iowa and uh, on that farm he grows goji berries and he also sells the plants you know a bare root uh, plant and they were about fifty dollars a plant when you buy a smaller quantity like I did so but these are these are considered really high quality goji berries and uh, you can see how they grow nice and plump and um, nice and, the color is nice so but um, just to say that the only time you're going to find a fresh goji berry is probably if you go to your backyard now I live in Southern California they do grow here Ningxia province is probably a similar climate or at least plenty of heat I think most of the harvesting in Ningxia is actually uh, accomplished by June so they usually grow one crop a year so if you if there's ever a shortage of goji berries it just means that the crop that you know last year's crop that has finally made it over to America uh, has run out and they have to grow some more and harvest them again and because transport time and so forth that new crop is probably not going to get here until about um, August or September because of the you know first of all harvesting and drying whatever they're going to do to process it to make it uh, you know able to be transported and then when once they do transport it it goes by ship container loads on ship and so those will eventually get here but it takes a number of weeks so we have a good idea of what goji berries look like uh, these are ones now there are about 80 grams of dried goji berries in this bowl and I usually have about 10 grams in the morning I put it right in my oatmeal and I put it in the water when I'm cooking it so that it has a chance to rehydrate so it gets you know the full benefit of the goji berry and I also use it in my banana bread when I bake that and add some goji berries to it but again I put them in hot water a little bit of hot water to warm them up to help them to swell and to get uh, you know not they're, they're never going to get back up to this size here you know the, the beautiful round smooth shiny skins but they are uh, more pleasant and I would recommend rehydrating your goji berries now if you use them in a, a Chinese herbal formula then you just put them in the, the water or whatever you're decocting and you know it cooks for sometimes 30 minutes or two hours or whatever the time is and so you get plenty of things and of course there are many molecules in plants that benefit us and uh, we'll be talking about some of that in a little while I'm, I'm going to read some material that I've collected about the nutritional nature of goji berries and also the story about how goji berries and longevity come together so I think I've said enough for you to get the idea of why I like goji berries and uh, they're also very convenient I mean as well, you like any dried fruit you can uh, put them in a little baggie put them in your pocket bring them along it'll help to um, stave off hunger stuff like that but that would be true of many other things and sometimes you see them even in a trail mix today or something like that so but um, I remember some of the earlier ones that I had had that were not sourced from the Chinese herbal store but were sourced from you know Costco or someplace they'd have a bag of goji berries at a high price and then when you opened it up they were they were chewy not firm and the firm is what I expect because when they dehydrate them it the water leaves and then they stay stable for a long time and the more water they absorb the chewier they get of course so if you're going to have them as a snack to chew on in your kitchen if you just want to grab some and eat them by the handful then I'd suggest you leave them out in a bowl for several days so they have a chance to absorb some water anyway that's that's enough said 
I'm going to take some time to uh, tell you the rest of the story. But if you're if you're leaving us now, uh, you you don't want to uh, take the next section, which I think I often get nominated for the most boring videos on YouTube um, each week <laughs> whenever I make these videos because I end up talking a long time and I think people are wondering, why don't you get to the point? <laughs> so um, I will tell the story next. Thank you for watching and uh, again, uh, Richard Lund. And we'll uh, be looking forward to seeing you on the next one if you're leaving us now. If you're going to hang around, I promise to tell you an interesting story about an old man from China. So this is the story about Li Qingyun, a resident of Kaxian in the province of Sichuan, who contended that he was one of the world's oldest men and said he was born in 1736, which would have made him 197 years old on the day he died 6th of May, 1933. A Chinese dispatch from Chongqing telling of Mr. Li's death said he attributed his longevity to peace of mind and that it was his belief that everyone could live at least a century by attaining inward calm. Compared with estimates of Li Qingyong's age in previous reports from China, the above dispatch is conservative. In 1930, it was said that Professor Wung Chong Tian dean of the Department of Education at Minkyo University, had found records showing Li was born in 1677 and that the imperial Chinese government congratulated him on his 150th and 200th birthdays. A correspondent of the New York Times wrote in 1928 that many of the oldest men in Li's neighborhood asserted that their grandfathers knew him as boys and that he was then a grown man. According to the generally accepted tales told in his province, Lee was able to read and write as a child, and by his 10th birthday had traveled to Kansu, Shanxi, Tibet, uh, Vietnam, Thailand, and Manchuria, gathering herbs. For the first hundred years, he continued at this occupation. Then he switched to selling herbs gathered by others. Wu Peifu, the warlord, took Lee into his house to learn the secret of his living to 250. Another pupil, said Lee, told him to keep a quiet heart, sit like a tortoise, walk sprightly like a pigeon, and sleep like a dog. According to one version of Lee's married life, he had buried 23 wives and was living with his 24th, a woman of 60. Another account, which in 1928 credited him with 180 living descendants, comprising 11 generations recorded only 14 marriages. This second authority said his eyesight was good, also that the fingernails of his right hand were very long. And long for a Chinese might mean longer than any fingernails ever dreamed of in the United States. One statement of the Times correspondent, which probably caused skeptical readers to believe Lee was born more recently than 1677, was that many who have seen him recently declare that his facial appearance is no different than that of persons two centuries his junior. Lee began his career as an herbalist at just 10 years of age and for almost 40 years had a diet of mostly herbs, goji berries, lingji, wild ginseng, hushu wu, Mr. Wu's black hair, goto cola, pennywort, and rice wine. He continued this for the next hundred years of his life. Now let's get to the vitamin A. Vitamin A is in goji berries. Here's, a, here's what it says. Vitamin A helps stimulate the production of collagen and is only found in animal-derived foods in its complete active form called retinol. Fruits and vegetables are, on the other hand, are high in phytonutrients called carotenoids, precursors of vitamin A, which the body must then convert to vitamin A. The best sources of vitamin A are meats, including liver, beef, cheeses, and egg yolks. Vegetarian, vegetarian sources that are high in beta carotene, which your body must then convert to vitamin A to utilize, are apricots, broccoli, carrots, kale, squash, sweet potatoes, and goji berries. Now this has 80 grams of goji berries in it. I usually eat about 10 grams in my morning cereal. In 10 gram ser serving, you have 35 calories. Uh, more than a half a cup of strawberries, 7.7 .7 grams of carbohydrate, 
1.3 grams of fiber, yay fiber, 4.6 grams of sugar, 1.4 grams of protein. 53.6% of the vitamin A one needs for each day, and 8% of the vitamin C, 3.8% of iron. Think about it, that's interesting. And zeaxanthin. Now that's, that's a magic molecule. <laughs> Not really, but it's interesting. Remember that there are really no superfoods. There are foods that are good for us and foods that are not so good for us. And there might be a, f a few foods or things we might drink that are really bad for us. <laughs> but zeaxanthin is one of the cool things that are in goji berries. So there was a study from China that I read recently and I thought I'd share it with you. Here's a title, it's kind of a long title. Goji berry effects on macular characteristics and plasma antioxidant levels, 13.7 grams per day in older women in China. So it's a little bit more than I eat, but yeah, pretty close. Here are the results. A placebo group demonstrated hypopigmentation and soft drusen accumulation in the macula. That's in the eye. Whereas the treatment group receiving goji berries remained stable. Both plasma zeaxanthin level and antioxidant capacity increased significantly in the treatment group by 26% and 57% respectively but did not change in the placebo group. No product-related adverse events were reported in either group. Their conclusions. Overall, daily dietary supplementation with goji berry for 90 days increases plasma zeaxanthin and antioxidant levels, as well as protects from hypopigmentation and soft drusen accumulation in the macula of elderly subjects. I guess I qualify, don't I? However, the mechanism of action is unclear. Given the lack of relationship between the change in plasma concentration of zeaxanthin and the change in macular characteristics, of course, blood goes to the eyes, doesn't it? <laughs> anyway, let's talk about some of the names. Uh, I may have mentioned some before, but uh, sometimes I've seen some ads that are pretty creative, meaning they don't tell the truth. They talk about Tibetan goji berries. Now, you get junk goji berries from China and great goji berries from Tibet. No, sorry, that's not the truth. The, the name goji is Mandarin. Goji is Mandarin. So if you're gonna call it a goji berry, it's not from Tibet, from their language, it's from Mandarin, from Chinese. Anyway. Um, Sometimes I've read even things like that they were never touched in picking. <laughs> you know, what, what are they going to do? Like shake them? Shake them off the, the stick? They don't do that. This is an old dried up branch. <laughs> They're still there. Anyway, the scientific name for these is the Lichium babarum. And uh, we talked about Lichium babarum perhaps and Lichium chinense in the past. And that is, the Lichium babarum is the one that I would prefer. And it's pretty much what you get if you get a from a, a reputable Chinese herb source, you're going to get lichium babarum. They don't necessarily even know that that's the name of them scientifically, but that's what they are. Um, they're grown on farms and they're they're handled by people. Uh, when, when you think about picking a goji berry, realize that you've got, this is the, you know, the berry and then there's this thing, the little thin thread that hangs down from the from the side branch here. Originally this forms a, a flower and then a bee comes along and pollinates it and then a, a little green a goji berry starts to grow and sometimes there'll be a little a little thread from the flower that hangs down here uh, which sometimes even has to be picked off. So if I was going to pick a goji berry I might just pick it you know, out of the the, uh, the green part there, so that's one. Or, you know, maybe I just pull it off. So what's left here is that, that very flexible, soft green part. Now, if you take a look here at these, these goji berries, you've got a, a shriveled up goji berry and you've got a little piece of that green part that's still left on there. And it's perfectly fine. 
you can eat it no problem so it's just a little bit of the what we call an aerial part you know when you describe a plant that you're going to eat or study for its uh, scientific uh, nature there's the part that are below ground and then the part that are above ground so aerial would mean that stuff that's above ground and this would be just a little bit of a I don't know that there I'm sure there's a technical word for the botany term for that little green part but I'm just saying don't worry about it don't sweat it if you happen to get some it's fine in the commercial version of course you don't have them and they don't have them because they're picked by hand, probably by people. Uh, lots of people. China has a lot of people. I've only been there once, uh, in 2005. Interesting trip, very interesting trip. And, you know, when we got off the airplane, when the, the first we first landed in Shanghai, and uh, we got off the airplane, and we walked down the jet bridges and, you know, corridors and so forth to go through customs, they had people stationed at every little turn and to guide us from one place to another. Uh, in restaurants, you know how we, we go into a restaurant somewhere in the United States, and maybe in a major city, and there's a, a host or hostess. I don't say, they don't say hostess anymore, do they? Host is the So you have a host. Well, in China, you go to a restaurant and you have five hosts. You know, they're all lined up there, ready to help you and uh, bring you to your table. And there's, uh, they've got lots of people and they use them for, for good things. Now you understand that, of course, part of the Chinese culture has been a one-child policy among the Han, which is the dominant people group. So something for Americans to remember when you're thinking about Chinese people and especially the Chinese military is Nobody in China wants to lose their one child to war. What's the reason besides, you know, the emotional reasons? They don't really have a regular, you know, social security system like we have. Turn 65, 66, 68, whatever the year is, and then you get some stuff from the government, Medicare and all that. It doesn't work that way. If you want somebody to help support you in your old age, it's going to be your kid. And uh, so that's the reason we don't, you really shouldn't worry about losing. I, yeah, I don't think we're going to have a war with China. Now, there might be some conflicts. I don't know. But I, I'm just saying they really, really care about that stuff. So that I uh, got sidetracked. I didn't mean to, but yeah, maybe I meant to. So we've got um, zeaxanthin. We've got these other interesting things in there. And they're good for us. Um, these are on the good food side. The only people that would maybe have trouble with a goji berry are people that are extremely sensitive to sulfites, if you happen to be, because they likely have some sulfites that are because of the, the proteins that make up the plant. There's some sulfur in some of those uh, in some of the uh, amino acids involved. So you're going to have some sulfites. And the other thing is, of course, because it's a fruit, it's going to have a fair amount of potassium. And uh, so that, that's something to think about as well. So it's nothing to worry about. But, um, you know, if you're, for instance, on kidney dialysis and you have to watch your potassium, goji berries are probably not going to be your friend. On the other hand, uh, you know, just if you're going to have some fruit, uh, let's say you're diabetic, there are only like a bazillion diabetics nowadays, if you're going to have some fruit, it might be a fruit that you could choose and it'd be a reasonable fruit. It'll give you some benefit beyond just a little bit of flavor. Okay, I think that's enough said about an interesting food. And I want to thank you for hanging on. If you've hung on this long, you are either a kind soul that, that likes to help an old man, or perhaps you're interested in what I've got to say. Either way, thank you. It's Richard Lund wishing you a healthy hundred years, and may you enjoy them all.